السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We're having a conversation. Uh, this is the fourth in the series of conversations about a renewing civilization. What we can learn from the best practices of Muslims. It's called renewing civilization. What we can learn from the best practices of Muslims. And what we've done in the previous programs is try to focus on some ideas that we think should start a conversation amongst Muslims, a uh, conversation uh, between Muslims and other people as well, about whether or not these are things are useful in terms of understanding what we need to move forward from the current economic crisis, to move forward from the current environmental crisis, to move forward from the current ethical crisis, and to move forward in a way that ensures peace among humanity. And thus far, we've talked about three major concepts that we feel that you can call from looking at the history of Islam and looking at some of the best practices of Islam over time, with particular emphasis on the role model of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And so if we, we take a good look at those three concepts for a moment by way of review, then we'll look at the fourth concept and this is the fourth show. The first concept we looked at was forbearance. And uh, the way we looked at this concept of forbearance and forbearance, uh, the way we defined it as being patient, being tolerant, and being good-natured while you're being patient and tolerant in the face of adversity. And that we look at the beginning or the founding community of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, we'll find that kind of patience, we find that kind of tolerance, and we find that kind of good-naturedness as exemplified by Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even while people resisted his message, even while people ridiculed him for the message that he brought, even while people were so enraged at him that they plotted to kill him. He was still patient, he was still tolerant, he still was good-natured. I mean, this was the nature of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This is the nature of a human being who didn't set out to found a great civilization. All he set out to do, from our understanding of reading his biography, from reading the Quran, from reading the reports that are authentic about him, all he sent out to do was to obey the Creator by transferring the message as he saw it. And he ended up as a byproduct creating great civilizations. And so we thought that we'd take a look back and see what is it amongst the best practices of Muslims, particularly Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that we might call out in order to get us past this current economic, environmental, and ethical crisis. And so forbearance is one. That is tolerance, that is tolerance and patience and good naturedness, even in the face of adversity. The second one is rule of law. The second one is rule of law. We define rule of law as a, a situation in a body politic where everybody was subject to the same regulations and sanctions. A situation in the body politic, whatever that political unit is, whether it's a city, a state, or a smaller unit, or borough, or town, or village. A rule of law means in that political entity, in that entity that's organized for the purposes of safeguarding the rights of everybody in that political entity, what we find is that everybody in that body politic is subject to the same regulations, subject to the same sanctions. Very, very important point. You can't have a, a thriving civilization without forbearance, particularly if it's a multicultural situation. And you can't have a thriving, particularly a multicultural civilization, and the world has gotten much, much smaller since the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It only took me 15 hours to get from New York to Mumbai. So it's a very much smaller world. It took him longer than that to get from Mecca to Medina. So we're talking about a much smaller world. So in fact, everybody lives in a multicultural world. So you have to have forbearance you have to have a situation where there's a rule of law where everybody is subject to the same rules and sanctions, right? Otherwise, you don't have a thriving, just civilization. So that's the second concept. And then the third concept that we talked about in our third show, the last show that aired, was the concept of God consciousness. The concept of God consciousness, or what Muslims call taqwa, the concept of God consciousness. And we argue that in many countries, like countries in the United States of America, 
the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people, as polled by uh, pollsters like the Gallup organization, G-A-L-L-U-P, the Gallup organization, you'll find if you poll the overwhelming majority of Americans, people who live in the United States of America like I do, if you poll them, you'll find that the overwhelming majority, over 90% of them believe in God. The problem is when we, we get down to the ethical level is that that belief in God doesn't seem to interpenetrate their behavior when they're dealing with one another. That belief in God doesn't seem to interpenetrate their behavior when they're dealing with one another. And so what we offer from the best practices of Muslims uh, is the notion of God consciousness. A God consciousness that we say that begins with the authority of God as exemplified in the charter of Medina as executed by Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that because he would do it in the name of God and it said this document is proved by God. We talked about the book of the Muslims, the Quran, and the difference between its importance to the Muslim and the difference between uh, the importance of the Bible to the Christians. It's just true that Jesus is more important to the Christians than the Bible is to them. Whereas for the Muslims, the Quran is first and then the tradition of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. A major, major difference. And so this difference is so powerful. And uh, if you want to understand something of this, a book that was published in 2007 is by a woman named Ingrid Matson, who's a professor of Islamic studies at Hartford Seminary in the United States. It's, the book is called The Story of the Quran. The Story of the Quran. I think the copyright date is 2007, no, uh, certainly no later than 2008. Uh, and uh, in a very engaging way, uh, she talks about uh, the nature and the function of this book and how important it is to Muslim identity. It gives the lingua franca of the Muslims, that is the common language of the Muslims worldwide, is Arabic. You can go from Malaysia to China to Pakistan to the United States to Jamaica to Bermuda and if you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu you'll get an answer wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu that glue that holds the Muslim ummah together is the Quranic language and that glue that lingua franca that holds it together usually entails some God consciousness assalamu alaikum assalam is one of the attributes of God for the Muslim. As-salam, the peace. So when you say as-salamu alaykum, we're saying the peace of God be upon you, the peace of the Creator be upon you. And salamu alaykum is found in the Quran as one of the greetings in paradise or in heaven as the Christians call it. So this is a very, very powerful notion that a person is going around all day saying as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and the answer is wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh just notice the difference between this and saying hello hi how are you doing assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh infuses a god consciousness in you and your daily dealings because this is something that you should spread. You should spread this saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and the smiles along with it. This is infuses into you. It gives me a warm feeling. I came to India for the first time and uh, I got off the plane and I was greeted with, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Even though I never had been to the country of India before, I felt at home, I felt welcome. I felt that I was among people who understood me and had a similar idea of God consciousness and had a similar vision as mine. This is very, very important to infuse this kind of God consciousness if you want to have a civilization. And so this, the, the words of the Quran infuse the conversation of the Muslim. Bismillah. Muslims before they eat, they say Bismillah. Before they do anything new, they say Bismillah. When they sneeze, they say, Alhamdulillah. If somebody says, that was a beautiful presentation you did, Dr. Jones. We say, Alhamdulillah. Well, so much so that people call us the Alhamdulillah people. On top of it, we say these words, MashaAllah, it is as God will. We say these things so much 
that it infuses the people around us. And so as we said before, that if you go to a place like Egypt, where there's a significant community of people called Coptic Christians, you'll find that they say, Alhamdulillah, all praises to God. And this is something you find in the Quran, and this is a way of cultivating God consciousness. So we talked about forbearance. We talked about the whole idea of God consciousness. We talked about the rule of law. We'll take up our fourth topic right after this break. We hope that you'll join us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So just before the break, we did a recap of what we've been doing in this series entitled Renewing Civilizations, What We Can Learn from the Best Practice of the Muslims. What We Can Learn from the Best Practice of the Muslims with a focus on the practice of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, because for Muslims, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is our role model. And so what we did was review the three major concepts that we talked about before. The three major concepts that we talked about before. One is forbearance. Two uh, is uh, the rule of law. And three is God consciousness. One is forbearance. Two is the rule of law. Three is God consciousness. The fourth concept is universal education. The fourth concept is universal education. So when we, uh, we spent a good deal of time in the last session part of the series talking about the, the impact that the Quran has on Muslims. We spent a good deal of time talking about that. We're going to get back to the impact, but we should uh, we'll stop for a moment and talk about the importance of education for any social system, any society, no matter how large or small. Education is important. I don't mean to say that schools are necessarily important. I would argue that even if you don't have a school, you have to have an educational mechanism to provide stability in any social setting. What do I mean by this? That education has three functions. One function of education is to transmit culture. One function of education is to transmit culture. Usually our first educators are our families. Therefore, the first entity that transmits culture to us is our family. And a Muslim family, what's the first thing that Muslims do? Many, many mothers, uh, while they're pregnant, will play the Quran in the original language, in Arabic, for the babies. I've seen it myself in Muslim families to begin that education in the womb. I mean, so there's a, a consciousness, because education is something that you do consciously. It doesn't have to be in the school. It doesn't have to be in the school, but it's something that you do consciously trying to transmit culture, trying to transmit values, trying to transmit norms to young people. So that's the first function of education. The second function of education, the second function of education is to maintain culture. The second function of education is to maintain culture. And usually we divide schools for this purpose because we, if we have an idea of who we are, as a civilization, whether you're the United States of America or the Muslim Ummah or India, if you have an idea of who you are as a civilization, you often set up schools in order to maintain that civilization. So the schools help you infuse the values, the norms, the rules and regulations of that particular society. So the second function of education is to maintain culture. The third function of education, the third function of education is to transform culture. The third function of education is a transformed culture. So if you look at the Quran, for instance, we find that we Muslims believe that the first revelation given to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was Iqra. 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 Surah 96. Iqra. Read. Read. Now, no matter how you translate this read, read uh, as we do as we read a book, read in the sense of uh, uh, proclaim, because one way of translating read, read means A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Nirajim Bismillahi Rahman Rahim This is a reading of the Quran, so it also means to proclaim. And the third, the third uh, most often discussed, at least from the scholar's perspective, the Muslim scholar's perspective, is reading creation. Reading creation, reading the signs of creation. 
no matter which, no matter which that you choose, that is reading as in reading a book or reading a text or reading as in proclaiming or reading as in reading the creation, all three of these interpretations of this first revelation to humanity. And again, if we look at Ibn Kathir, which we find online, Ibn Kathir is Mufasir who was qualified to make a tafsir or commentary on the Quran. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he got this read. Uh, he said, I cannot read. He said to the angel Gabriel, read. He, he said, I cannot read because he, he was not literate in that sense. This is before the printing press. This is before universal education as we know it in the modern West, the modern so-called West. And so one function, as I said before, of education is to transform culture. And if we look at Surah 96, if we look at any one of the three interpretations of Ikra, of read, all three are intellectually engaging. All three interpretations, whether you read a text, I mean, you usually don't come in this world being able to read. It's something that you have to learn how to do. It's called decoding, right? Decoding is intellectually engaging. If you're going to read by proclaiming, that is, become a hafiz of Quran, and so you read it from memory, it's intellectually engaging, right? And so if you're going to read uh, the creation and you're going to make some general propositions as a scientist does from reading creation, as a biologist does, as a geologist does by reading creation, this is an intellectually engaging proposition. And so what's my point here is that uh, Islam is not a bunch of old fossilized rules. Islam is not a bunch of old fossilized rules. The first revelation the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, encouraged intellectual inquiry. The first revelation to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, encouraged intellectual inquiry. Therefore, that, that, that transformative nature of education is implicit in the Quran. The transformative nature of education is implicit implicit in the Quran. And so education has three functions, as I said before. Number one, to transmit culture. Usually we get that in uh, families of origin. Number two is to maintain culture. Usually we get that in our schools, our elementary, our first section schools, our first level schools, however you call it in the country from which you come. And the third is to transform culture, that intellectual inquiry. Usually you find it in colleges and universities in research institutions and, and Muslims, we need to have all three of these institutions to be very, very strong in order for our civilization to be strong, i.e., that is for our families to be strong, in order for us to have civilization, we must have strong families based on strong Islamic principles. In order for us to have maintain our culture, we must have school system that's based on Islamic principles in order to transform our culture, in order to keep up with the changes that are going on inevitably in the world, we have to have a transformative institutions of higher learning and think tanks and institutes in order to do this. And we've done this. Muslims have done this in the past. We looked at Baghdad. We look at El Andalus. We look at the Iberian Peninsula during the golden age of Islamic flowering during that particular time. We have actually done this thing and this is something that both Muslims can learn and that people uh, who are not Muslims can learn from the current situation. That is to say that we need universal education. We need universal education. And if we look at these three functions of education, we'll see that within the, uh, the Islamic experience, we've had all three of them. We've had the situation where an effort we've had made to transmit the culture as exemplified by the fact that it is an art and is highly regarded in the Muslim world at this particular time to be hafiz of Quran. This is one of the ways that we, we transmit our culture. At this very point, almost every moment of the day, because Muslims are spread out of the world, somebody is memorizing Quran with the near, with the intention of memorizing the whole thing from beginning to end, exactly the way Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, memorized it over 1400 years ago without changing a sound, without changing a letter, no matter what your language is, Bengali, 
uh, Spanish, Arabic, English, Aramaic, no matter what your language is, this, this process of transmitting this culture is going on as we speak. When it comes to maintaining culture, we can find this amongst the Muslims as well. We look within the Muslim uh, polity, we'll find that this notion of seeking knowledge from the cradle to the grave is something that is urged upon Muslims and it's something that we're struggling with in our families, in our institutions right now. When it comes to transforming culture, it's something that Muslims have fallen behind on, let's be honest, because we're not producing the kind of new ideas that we're producing during the time of El Andalus and Baghdad. We don't have that intellectual synergy. What's synergy? Synergy is where the whole is equal to more the sums of its parts. The intellectual synergy comes from the study and the debate and the ideas that we have with one another based on the ideas that come not only from within the Muslim Ummah, but people who used to come and study with us in El Andalus who weren't Muslims, from people who used to come and study with us in Baghdad who weren't Muslims. That intellectual synergy is missing right now, and we offer it again to the Muslims and to the wide world. And so what we're talking about here is renewing civilizations what people can learn from the best practices of the Muslims. We've talked about four concepts that we think that have been important over the past four series. One is forbearance, that you need to have a good civilization. Another is rule of law, what you need to have a good civilization. The third is God consciousness, something that's needed for a good civilization. And the fourth is universal education, where everybody in the society has access to education. We hope that you've learned something through these four sessions. We have another session. We hope that you'll join us again as we continue this conversation about renewing civilizations, what we can learn from the best practices of the Muslims. Until the next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Oh, people of the world.